super excited for tonight. Uh, we're we're going to be talking about one of my favorite, favorite topics in scripture. I think it's super countercultural, but I also think it's a key to living an incredibly great life, but even more, there's something better to being close to the Lord. Now, what I'm talking about is this. Uh, there's a word in the Bible called gentleness or meekness. But again, it's a very misunderstood word, which I'll get to more in a minute. But there's an incredible, incredible connection to Jesus when you have that. Um, and so what, what it really means, the, the, probably the main meaning of the word, not probably, the main meaning of the word is to be well-trained. To be well-trained. Now, think about this. I have a friend named Randy Miller. He is uh, at one time one of the top animal trainers in all of Hollywood. And so he had these grizzly bears that he trained, lions that he trained, tigers. If you saw the original gladiator, those are all his tigers that are in it. But the wild thing, they're super strong, super powerful, but they're super affectionate. And when he comes out, when they see Randy, they like light up and they want to be around him. And here's why. Because when you are the master and the animal is well-trained, there's an attachment to you. Um, Anybody in here into horses? How many people are into horses? So you know that if you have a well-trained horse, what happens? That horse wants to be around you, right? And you have a connection to the horse. Uh, So Pam and I uh, have three dogs, and one of the dogs is Zena. Zena is a Saint Berdoodle. She's half St. Bernard, half giant poodle. She is super strong. Uh, We got her to run off wild animals, which uh, last night she ran off a bear. Uh, the bears got afraid of her and took off. And so she's really, really strong, but she's super, super affectionate. But she also is like a puppy. She's a three-year-old puppy at a hundred pounds. Watch this. That's our animal trainer. <laughs> okay, so no groomer was hurt in this filming of this, but um, that's her groomer, and she loves her groomer. And this lady just stopped to see Zena because Zena so caught her attention, and you saw her just take her down the hill, and she's that strong. So we've been working and working and working to try to have her be uh, more well trained for her own good and ours. And so, guess what? Zena's coming out right now, and you get a chance to see her. Hey, big girl. Hey, hey, you can let her go. Oh, yeah, here we go. So she is just a great, great dog. She's coming along in her training. And uh, so, we're, you know, we're going to see how this goes tonight with distractions and stuff. So uh, that's a little bit risky, uh, but we'll see. Zena, come over here. Place, place. Come here. Place. Zena. Oh, you got your leash. All right, sit down. There you go. Yeah, good girl. Zena, sit. Zena, watch me. Watch me. We're going to try to get a shot of this. Watch your eyes. Watch me. Watch me. Yes, there. Yeah. Here's the treat. Go get one. Yeah. We'll see if she does it. We'll see. Come on, girl. Wrong way. All right. So that didn't work so well. Zena, come here. Come here. All right. Come on. Sit. You're a good girl. You stay there. You stay there. Oh my goodness, look what I got. Come. Yeah, sit down. Okay, good girl. All right, we'll try one more time just for fun. All right, come here, Zena. Zena. <laughs> oh, well. So she's getting it. She's getting it. Come here. There we go. All right. One more time. That's it. All right, and that's Zena anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah. So slowly but surely she's getting it. 
But the more she gets it, guess what? The more things she can do. Like she gets to do more and more and more. And so uh, one, uh, about a week and a half ago, there was a rattlesnake in our backyard and she's getting right on it. And I called her away and she came right away, which by the way, protected her, right? Because uh, she, she thinks she could play with rattlesnakes. Um, and so the whole idea behind this word is understanding that God wants us to be that way with him. But it's, it's not a negative thing. It's a super positive one uh, because the affection gets stronger. The connection, the connection goes deeper. And God wants you and I to experience that. And so we want to have that. So we're in a series on the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And uh, whenever you have the Holy Spirit filling you and moving in you and, and in control, then what happens, these fruits emanate from you. And so there's really only one singular fruit, love, but there are nine graces that come out of that, and gentleness is one of them. But let's look at the verse together again, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But as the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, which we're getting into tonight, self-control, against such things there is no law. So gentleness is not something you and I typically seek after. Uh, let me give you an example. Charmin is considered gentle. How many of you want to be Charmin? Yeah. Uh, and you know what? The Smurfs are considered gentle. Uh, but I don't think there's a man in the room that says, my dream is to be a Smurf. You know, uh, uh, but you know what is interesting is it becomes countercultural to everything we think about, but it gives us the most incredible life you could possibly experience. When you're under the control of the Spirit, when Jesus Christ is your master, and, and he loves you and guides you and directs you and trains you to do things you never could do before, uh, and trains you to have a power you would never have outside of him, then, then you have the energy and strength harnessed in such a way that it becomes focused and it makes a bigger and bigger difference in lives. Uh, if you see a well-trained police dog, what happens? That dog can do things it never would have done had it not been trained, right? Uh, when you see a well-trained soldier, uh, by the way, it's interesting, Mike, we call an officer an officer and a gentleman. But that mean, doesn't mean you're gentle, uh, meaning meek or weak. It means you're well-trained, more harnessed, and ready to go. And so what God wants you to be is a gentleman or a gentle person who's well-trained, focused, and able to do better and better things. And here's what's so interesting about it. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said, if you're gentle, you'll actually take over the world. Gentle people will rule your world. So your particular world, you'll become the most powerful person in it. Not because you're seeking power and acclaim, but because you're focused and, and your strength is harnessed in that way. In Matthew 5, 5, it says, blessed are the gentle for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the gentle for they shall inherit the earth. The word gentleness is a Greek word that means gentleness, humility, and meekness. But it also has, it means this. One definition is this, to not be overly impressed by your sense of self-importance. To not be over, overly impressed by one's uh, sense of self-importance. In other words, I don't walk around feeling more important or more powerful or more prideful because I know who my master is. And I know he's in charge and he's in control. And I know he's directing me to act a certain way or to hold back on certain things. And, and it makes me better. It makes me stronger. But it doesn't make me more prideful. That's a sign of gentleness. Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says the best use of this word is in the taming of animals. The taming of animals. So Zena, well, uh, the more I work with her, she's going to retain her strength, but we're going to be able to focus it in a better way. And so, you know what? It's going to be more fun to go on a walk with her when she's not dragging somebody down a hill uh, like, uh, you know, they're, they're sledding. Um, but you know what I want you to think about is the whole idea. Think about this. If Zena is well-trained, what can I do? I can take her more places. When she's not well-trained, I can't. By the way, I've told this before. One of my favorite places to take her is Lake Arrowhead Village because people line up to pet her. Now, and I'm not, when I'm not using that term like loosely, I mean, I'll have a line of six, seven, eight, nine people lining up to pet her. 
But as long as she stays gentle, she can have moments like that. But if she's out of control, she can't. When you and I are gentle, Jesus can take us into situations and places uh, where you're going to experience things you never experience outside of having him in control like that. So the word is about taming animals. Uh, It literally means, according to Socrates, strength under control. Again, it's not the idea of lack of strength. It's strength under control. And it's used of a war horse that is well trained. It's used of, get ready for this one, a gentle breeze in contrast to a howling wind. It's used of a fire in the fireplace rather than a mile from my house threatening to make us evacuate. (laughs) That actually happened. So I'm I'm the only one. Okay. All right. But gentle people will inherit the earth. They'll inherit the earth. So I want you to think about this. What's more powerful, a splintered board or a baseball bat? The baseball bat, right? Because it's been sanded down. It's, it's harnessed so we can use its strength better. It, it might be the same piece of board. But because it's been molded by somebody and put in the hands of someone like Shohei Otani, who is not with the angels anymore. Anyway, and, uh, uh, but you know what? Then you see incredible strength coming and the use of that bat being more amazing at that point. Uh, I would also say this. Uh, if Shohei Itani c- continues on the road he's on, how much more will his bat be worth? The bat, all you guys know baseball, right? It, it can become almost priceless. Does everybody agree? Yeah, but it's because it's in the hands of a master at that point. You will become more priceless and more priceless uh, because you're in the hands of the Lord and you'll actually inherit the earth. Uh, I have a friend who is, uh, I haven't seen in a while, uh, but he was a fellow youth pastor. We did youth ministry together and then he shocked us all uh, by leaving a very, very successful youth ministry position and I took his place at a church called Nine Avenue Christian Church and his name's Mike Fields. And, and Mike, again, a good friend of mine and his wife, Karen, good friend of ours. Uh, Mike said, you know what? I love being a youth pastor, but I've always had a heart's desire to be a police officer. And so he became a police officer for the city of Fullerton. The wild thing is this. Mike is super sharp. There's no doubt about it. But if anybody in my mind is gentle, it was Mike, Mike Fields. Now, Mike's strong. I mean, he, he was an incredibly strong, uh, very expert marksman. But the thing about him was he was always in control. So I'm going to ask you a question. I bet you know the answer. If you're going into a firefight and you need a partner, do you want someone rash or in control? In control, control, without a doubt. So because of that, Mike kept getting promotion after promotion after promotion. And and one time there was a a, a shootout with an armed suspect they were very, uh, very concerned about. And so Mike was the one who was sent to go around and sneak up on him because Mike wouldn't lose his cool. And uh, I heard the story, not from Mike, but another officer. He got to watch it happen. Mike gets right behind this guy, and he doesn't, doesn't know Mike's coming. And Mike puts the gun up to his head and very calmly said, you need to drop it or you're done. And the guy's freaking out, you know. But Mike stayed so calm so that he got his ultimate promotion, or honor anyway. Uh, when the Fullerton Police Department decided they needed a chaplain, Uh, The higher-ups were meeting together, and they said, why do we hire somebody from the outside? We have Mike Fields. We have Mike Fields. So Mike remained a police officer, but they gave him that cross to wear as a chaplain, and they honored his Christian commitment, and he was free to talk about Jesus all he wanted. He inherited the earth, yeah. So... What I'm trying to say is that's how you end up getting promotions and promoted by God because you're under his control and the meek inherit the earth. The gentle inherit the earth. By the way, you inherit a better marriage. You inherit a better better workplace. You inherit a better better ministry, uh, better friendships because you're not rash. You're not brash. You're not out of control. You're under the control of the Holy Spirit. And and God, God moves in you because Jesus is your master. And God wants you to be gentle and under his control. Uh, In Galatians 5, again, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, but gentleness and self-control. And it says when that happens, there's no need for law at that point. Uh, Let me go back to my dog, Zena. When she is incredibly under control, you know what I could do? I can let her out in the front yard with no leash. There's, there's no need to, to leash her. Why? Because she's under control. Uh, I could take her on walks without a leash, off leash. Why? Because she's under control. 
Uh, I could put her in situations where, you know, she can have extra fun because she's under control. Uh, and here's the thing. When you're under God's control, there's no need for God to have to rein you in. Why? Because he can unleash you to do great things. And we need to understand that. So when we walk by the Spirit, then we're going to bear the fruits of the Spirit. And when we're gentle and under the control of God, then what happens is goodness and self-control also takes hold of us. And when we're under God's control, and then here's what happens. We will be gentle and be at our best. Now, when you think about this. You will be at your best. You'll live the best life. You'll experience the best things. The, the most amazing promises of God will be yours when you're under his control. And you and I need this. You need this when you're driving down the freeway or in a crowded mall so you don't just run people over. Uh, a mom needs this when she's had a hard day at work and comes home to her two and four-year-olds who start acting like two and four-year-olds. <laughs> Okay, come on. That's good. Um, a man needs it when the umpire at his son's little league game makes a bad call. A lot of men need it then. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is gentleness is going to cause us to experience life at its best. Life at its best and you being your best and will keep you from becoming your own worst enemy. See, too often, um, I, I know I can be my own worst enemy. How many in here can be your own worst enemy? Yeah, and those of you who didn't raise your hand, man, you're your own worst enemy uh, at this point. Uh, because you know what? We can be. But when you're going to have gentleness in your life, you're never going to be your own worst enemy. You're going to be like your own best friend. And you'll be like Jesus. Jesus was gentle. Strongest man who ever walked the planet was Jesus. I want you to know that. Sometimes the way they portray him in movies or paintings or whatever, he looks like kind of this, he looks wimpy. But you know what? He couldn't be a carpenter and be wimpy. You couldn't take the beating he took and carry the cross as far as he did and be wimpy. Yeah, there's no way. He, without a doubt, was the strongest man who ever lived. And he was gentle. Matthew 12, 18 says, Behold my servant, talking about Jesus, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I am well, my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And notice how now the gentleness becomes defined. He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. In other words, he doesn't have a need to raise his voice. He doesn't have a need to talk over anybody. Do you know why? Because he has that kind of strength. He has that kind of strength. It says, and this is a part I love. It says, a battered reed he will not break off. And a smoldering wick he will not put out. Until he leads justice to victory. And his name, the Gentiles, will hope. Um, Pam one time was given this really cool Easter lily gift and she was so excited about it. It had a beautiful lily on the top with the long stem on it and it was in a place I didn't want it to be. It, by the way, it was in a place that Pam wanted it to be. So I waited until she wasn't around and I picked it up and turned and it hit something. What do you think happened? Oh yeah, right away. It just flopped. And I thought, oh my gosh, if it was Jesus, he could talk it back to life. But I, <laughs> I just had to apologize. But, um, but it says even a bruised reed won't be broken because he's that gentle. He's able to coax it back to life. So here's the point I want to make is when you're like a smoldering wick and you feel like your fire's about to be extinguished and you're not sure you can't go on, Jesus gently comes to you and fans the flame in your heart to have it burn bright again. That's what he does. He doesn't come. If he treated you roughly, you'd be extinguished like that. He would never do that to you. Uh, if you're a bruised reed that's about to think it's, and it's over, there's no hope, Jesus can coax you back to life and strength and beauty and experiencing the best things because he's gentle. And then he wants you and I to be that way. He wants you and I to be that way with other people. Uh, with a teenager who's a little out of control, can we come and gently course correct them? Not just let them off, the strength under control. But we don't come and berate them and badger them and say things that later on are echoing in their mind, making them feel like failures and worthless. Man, that, by the way, does that get anybody anywhere? The answer is no, never, right? Uh, and, and so when, when you're in the midst of helping somebody, you know, you want to say honest, truthful, strong, loving, caring, gentle 
things. That's what we need to do. And so Jesus was gentle with a woman caught in adultery. Do you know, remember what happened? Is, is Jesus, said, he said, whoever has, is, has no sin, let him cast the first stone. And it says everybody who was about to stone her for being caught in the very act of adultery, they drop their stones and leave. By the way, I don't want you to miss this. Jesus is left alone with her. Where's Peter? Where's James? Where's John? Where's the rest of the apostles? They probably picked up stones too. They probably thought, all right, we're going to start taking this area. Oh. And Jesus said, whoever doesn't have sin, cast the first stone. And they had to drop their stones and walk away too. And then Jesus looked at her and said, where are your accusers? And she said, there's none, Lord. And you know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't pick up a rock and said, well, this isn't your day. I don't have any sin, you know. <laughs> he said, I don't accuse you either. He was gentle with her. Uh, Jesus was gentle with the woman who had the issue of blood and for 12 years was isolated. And, and Craig talked about that. And, and you know what is, is he wanted to love on her. Uh, Sawyer is going to be talking about her later. Uh, he was gentle with Peter, who felt he was such a failure. He could never be forgiven and used by God again. And what did Jesus do? He cooked him breakfast. Isn't that, isn't that wild? The Lord said, hey, let's have breakfast together. And at breakfast, I want to talk about love. And I want to talk about the fact that I need you to feed my sheep. You know, he, he didn't talk about his failure. Uh, and, and he was gentle with him. Peter needed that. He was gentle with me when I was in my sin. I did not find when I experienced the presence of God, con condemnation, or a feeling of worthlessness, I, I felt like the Lord wanted me. Anybody else feel that way when you experience God? You just feel like, you know, he does want me. He wants me. And uh, he wants to be that way with you. So Jesus transformed Peter, James, and John from being rash and brash men with rough edges into men who were gentle. Peter was quick with his words and with the sword. He even cuts off Malchus's ear. And he would go on to be a person who would lead the church and preach about love and, and be un under complete control. James and John were known as the sons of thunder. Uh, I've always thought about this. If uh, James and John were alive in our time, they would pull up riding Harleys and have leather jackets and walk in and sit over there where all our bikers always sit. Yeah, yeah don't you think so? And you know what? They became the most loving, and John became known as the apostle of love. You know, so, so he transformed them. And that's what the Lord wants to do with me. That's what the Lord wants to do with you. And when you're filled with the Spirit, then the Spirit will smooth your rough edges and make you gentle. Like that rough board, splintered board, becoming a baseball bat. Still has power, actually more power. Still is useful, actually more useful. Its value increases incredibly, but it's not rough. It's not splintery. It's not abrasive. So Jesus wants us to learn from him. So in Matthew chapter eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, Jesus said these words, and I want you to know these are for you. These are for you. They're for me. They're for you too. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. By the way, I'm going to go back to my dog, Zena. I I love it when she's a little out of control. I say, hey, girl, come here. And she comes. Uh, and in and, and that moment, we're going to have an incredible time. If you didn't catch it, I've got this dog training I'm doing with her. The foundation of it is called Watch Me. That, that's the one thing. And I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but she's right now, when I say the words, watch me, her eyes brighten with joy. And, and she's looking right at me. And in that moment, something cool is going to happen. And so Jesus is saying, come to me. And I think he's saying, watch me. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now, yoke was put to train an animal. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? Listen to these words. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That is wild. Some people today are just too worn out. You're drained. You're tired. You can't wait for the weekend, and when the weekend's over, you're not rested. You never seem to get ahead. And you know what? It's sometimes you're, man, I just need time. I need rest. Well, let me tell you, the number one way to get rest isn't a day off, as much as you might need that. It's being with a Lord who loves you and having him give you rest, not just in your body, but to the depth of your soul.
And if your soul is rested, you know what? You're going to have energy and you're going to be invigorated. And that's what he says. You'll find rest for your souls. And he goes, for my yoke, my training is easy and my burden is light. Uh, my training is easy and my burden is light. And maybe I'm use, overusing Zena, but I can tell you this. The minute the bag of treats comes out, she goes crazy with joy because we're going to have fun. The training's going to be fun. Uh, the only other time she gets more excited is when she sees her leash. And so if she can get her, bo- her mouth on the leash, she'll bring it to me. You know, she'll bring it and just want me to do something with her. She wants to be trained. Why? She loves it. How many, how many of you guys got animals that want to be trained? Yeah, it's just, isn't it cool how that happens? And so the, we want to be that way with the Lord. We want to be that way with the Lord. So we need to have that happen to us. We need to be under Jesus' training. We need the Holy Spirit molding us and guiding us. And this is what life is to be like when you're born again. When you're born again as a Christian, this is what life to be like. And even more, this is what you're destined for. To be like Jesus. And what did Jesus say? I'm gentle. I'm gentle and I want you to be like me. Romans 8, 28 to 30 says this. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew. By the way, what that means is this. Before you ever, ever were born or conceived even, he knew you. He knew you. He actually knew you. And this might surprise some of you. He likes you. He actually likes you a lot. And he knew you. But but for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. But he did predestine something. That to become conformed to the image of his son. Uh, The predestination every single person has, everybody has, is we be conformed to the image of Jesus. Which means in big part, we would be gentle under God's control. And then it says this, uh, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called, and then he called, he also justified, and these he, he uh, justified. Look at that last part, he glorified. Do you know we want to give glory to God? Everybody know that, right? Did you know God wants to give glory to you? God wants to glorify you. And, and, and this is all a part of what the Lord has for you. That you and I be conformed to Jesus and, and we be gentle in who we are. So let me say some things that show when we're gentle, when we've nailed it. When we are so filled with the Spirit, the fruit of gentleness comes out. Uh, you'll know you're a gentle person when, number one, you pray instead of retaliate. You pray instead of retaliate. Uh, you know what? Too often life can seem like it, it's against us and people can seem like they're against us. Uh, it reminds me of the school teacher who had a group of uh, preschoolers and they, they were out playing on the playground and she got them all together and a fire truck came by and on the fire truck was a Dalmatian. And she looked at the kids and they go, did you see that dog? And all the kids are like, yeah, that was a cool dog. And they said, do you know what the dog's for? And, and one of the kids goes, I think it's to uh, find the smoke and find the fire. And, and another kid goes, no, 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 no. It's just to be a friend to the firefighters. They need a friend because their lives are hard. And another little boy said, no, it's not. The dog's there to help them fire, find the fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be gross, but do you ever feel like you're the fire hydrant and there's a lot of dogs coming? Yeah, so here's the point I want to make is in those kind of moments, do we pray instead of retaliate? Uh, Do we pray instead of retaliate? You know, are we brash and rash? Are we calm and caring? And are we able to step back from what's happening and look to see what's really going on? Because gentle people do that. And when we're in control of the Holy Spirit, then here's what I want you to know. We, We start with prayer. And I think that you would agree with this. Let's see if you do. I think it's really hard to lash out to somebody you're praying for. When, when I stop myself and say, wait a minute, I want to be under control of the Lord. I want to be gentle. I want to pray for my, my person. Maybe you're being my enemy. It's really hard to lash out when I'm praying genuinely for you uh, and praying the best for you and praying that God's will would be done in your life and praying you'd be the best person you could be. It's hard to lash out after that. It's hard to lash out during that. 
Uh, in Matthew 5, 43 to 45, Jesus said this, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. By the way, I, I know that we try here and, and we actually do a pretty good job of not getting political, but man, we gotta quit hating people because of their political party. Yeah, we just can't do that. Uh, and, and, you know, he said, I don't want you to hate your enemy. He goes on to say, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So you may be sons of your father who's in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. So you and I are called by God uh, to pray instead of retaliate. Uh, and prayer does change us. I wish I could tell you it would change them. When someone's hard to get along with, some's even mean to you, some's reviling towards you, or they are genuinely an enemy, and you start praying for them, you're going to find you changing. You're not always going to find them changing. You know, I want to tell you, I, I really tried to practice this. And there's been times when I'm in a situation. I one time went to pray at the Crony City Council, and uh, I had to slip out to go to another appointment. And this guy came running out, screaming at me, Pastor Chuck, Pastor Chuck, you're you're the worst person in the city of Corona. And and he's screaming and yelling and cussing at me. And I thought, all right, pray, pray, pray. Um, he's little enough, I could take him. But uh, <laughs> pray. And I, I just prayed and I tried to calm myself and he was more escalating. I wish I could tell you that as I prayed, he stopped and went, oh, I'm so sorry and dropped on his knees and said, forgive me. Can I go with you to Crossroads and get baptized? No, he didn't do that. <laughs> I wish. C.S. Lewis said this, I don't pray to change God's mind. I pray because prayer changes me. Amen. Yeah, and so when you pray instead of retaliate, yeah, yeah, that's worth the clap, Yeah. When you pray instead of retaliate, it is going to change you. You're going to find yourself gentle. Uh, you're going to actually know, not even find yourself gentle. You're going to go, Lord, it's working. The fruit of gentleness is here. So you'll know you're a gentle person when, number one, you pray instead of retaliate. Number two, you reinterpret your rage. You reinterpret your rage. Uh, it's interesting. This was a big part of my counseling training when I was doing graduate work in counseling and when I was beginning to practice counseling. Trying to get people to say, okay, what is it that you're so mad about? How can you reinterpret that so it becomes something positive and not negative? When anger starts to well up, then I need to stop and choose to act in a godly way instead of an ungodly way. That's one way to reinterpret my rage. I need to be gentle and under the control of Jesus. I need to know the truth of the power of the promise of Proverbs 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so, uh, you know, I've shared it before, but I'm going to share it again. Uh, Dr. David Smith, who was my mentor in counseling, he said that whenever you get angry, immediately become a limp noodle. Because you physically, or, or you can't, if you're physically relaxed, physically dropping, you're not going to be able to well up the rage in your mind and more in your brain. It's going to shut down your amygdala, and uh, it'll allow you not to be that kind of a person. So when you explode in anger, let me ask you a question. Do you ever feel good about it? I, I got to say that in my life, that I, I can't name a time that I feel good that I exploded in anger. Matter of fact, I feel bad. I'm going to use a word that most of you do not like, stupid. I, I don't know about you, but that can really set people's emotions off. But not trying to be mean or condescending or make you feel bad. When I get taken over by rage, I am stupid. And I never act right. I never make the right decision. So I want to reinterpret my rage. Uh, I, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to lose it. I don't want to give in to the power of the flesh. I want the Holy Spirit to take over. And I want to find myself not being that way. And uh, not long ago, not trying to make myself look good, uh, period, but I was in a, a situation and this guy kept saying really disrespectful things, but another guy from Crossroads was there. And this guy kept saying it and I thought, we're not going to get anywhere. So my reinterpretation was this. There's no need to respond because he's not going to listen. There's no need to argue. He's not gonna, I'm not going to get anywhere. I, and so I, we were happened to be eating a lunch, and he's going at me, and I just kept thinking, man, these chips are good. 
And, uh, and, 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 and I, I wasn't just totally tuning him out. I waited for a moment to take a shot and see, not a shot shot, but a, just to make it, <laughs> not a shot. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was relaxed. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even do that. But, uh, but, but the thing I want to say is that um, I, I stayed really calm. And uh, when it was all over, I felt good. And I'm not happy about what he said or some of the ways he acted. But I did pray for him. I didn't retaliate. I reinterpreted what was happening. I kept thinking, you know what? I think he's, he's been raised in a very legalistic background. And that's really got him in bondage. And I, 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 that's what I see happening here. Not even, I don't think he's against me. I, I think he's just having a hard time with the Christianity of freedom, which by the way, the Bible says it's for freedom that Christ set you free. And uh, so I was able to do the reinterpretation. But as we're walking out, this other guy from Crossroads put his arm on him. He said, man, I'm proud you're my pastor. I'm really proud you're my pastor. You, you, you did it. Man, you know, you represented Jesus in our church well. And I, I had his respect. Let me say this. When you don't lose your cool your kids will respect you more. Uh, you know, sometimes you think I got a disrespectful child. The, don't let them get you to lose your cool because you're not going to gain their respect. And so you need to stay in control. And I want you to think about how the New Living Translation translates Galatians 5, 19 to 21, which is that section where the fruit of the Spirit is found, but it's right above it. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. Notice the next part, hostility. Quarreling. Remember, Jesus didn't quarrel. Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension and division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other such things, sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, but if you're gentle, not only will you inherit the kingdom of God, you'll inherit the earth. And uh, so we know, we know we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit when we're not uh, lashing out in anger, but we reinterpret our rage. We reinterpret our age. Now, now, I want you to think about this. What is it that gets you angry? Many of us, if we got honest, actually all of us, we get angry at inanimate objects that have no feelings or intellect. You know that? You get angry at stoplights that won't change. What's wrong with that stupid light? You get angry when the fi- Wi-Fi doesn't work. Uh, you, I, I got to be honest. Uh, one day, I was standing in front of an elevator, and I hit the button, and it wouldn't come. So I started to get mad, so I started hitting it more. Does, is that going to make it come faster? No. And, and it's an animate object, and that just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, by the way, we get angry uh, very often at people. And we say, like, they make me so mad. And I've shared this before, but that's not true. Do you know who makes you mad? You. Yeah, me. Who makes me mad? I make me so mad. And I got to choose not to do that. I got to reinterpret what's going on and do better than that. By the way, we had a a special speaker come to Crossroad. This is really kind of funny. Well, it's kind of funny. Just kind of. We had a special pe- uh, speaker come to Crossroads, and they're driving down to Ontario, and a car goes by them with a Crossroads sticker on it because he knew our logo. He goes, hey, they're from Crossroads. And he goes to pull around, and for some reason they got mad, and when he came up, they rolled down their window and flipped him off. <laughs> I said, I think it's one of our elders. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I said that. I did that. I mean, why not at that point? So, but it's our choice whether we get mad or not. This guy came in laughing. He didn't get mad. He, he thought it was the funniest thing ever. Um, okay. All right. You'll know you're a gentle person when you pray instead of retaliate. You reinterpret your rage. You release grudges. You're a forgiving person. God smoothed me out by helping me release grudges quickly. Not hang on to them. Not let bitterness have a chance to be in my heart. When I get mad, I have three choices. I can repress it, express it, or I can confess it. What does that mean to confess it? Say, Lord, I, I'm really starting to get angry. Lord, I'm starting to struggle with this, and I need you. You're the master. I, I'm your servant. I'm yours. I need to act in this way that you want me to. Um, you know what? You, if you're gentle, you're not going to hang on to a grudge. You're not going to let your, yourself stew in it. You're going to forgive and forge ahead. 
Forgive and forge ahead. Ephesians 4, 2 and 3 says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Now, did you catch that last part? Making allowance for each other's faults. You know, uh, I've always said this, that uh, there's no perfect church. And every time someone says, well, I'm leaving the church because, man, I don't know if I, how, the people at Crossroads, if they're for real, I'm like, well, don't go to a perfect church. You'll mess it up. <laughs> You know what? Maybe you're angry at someone who embarrassed you or hurt you or someone who slighted you or treated you unfairly or with disrespect. Just forgive and forge ahead. Because I got to be honest, I've done every one of those things. I've embarrassed people. I've hurt people. I've slighted people and I've treated people with disrespect. I wish it wasn't true, but it's true. Haven't we all done that? So let's just make allowances for those times of weakness that are there. So when you're filled with anger and bitterness or have a grudge, then what happens? That means life is squeezing on you. And make sure what comes out of you is good. Make sure the words that come out of you are good because your heart is filled with really good things. And in Matthew 12, 35 to 37, Jesus said, the good man brings out of the, uh, his good treasure what, or the, out of his good treasure what is good. And the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they will give account on it for the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Now, what is he saying? If I, I walk through a mall at Christmas time and it's crowded and someone bumps on and bumps onto me and I have hot chocolate or coffee in a cup, what's going to spill out is what's in the cup, right? When I'm walking in that same situation and someone bumps into me, the words that come out of me are what's in here. So when I'm gentle, it's way better. I had not long ago was in a store and uh, uh, probably almost junior high boy was running just out of control, not watching where he went. And he hit me and his, his mom freaked. So he hits into me and here's what I was so excited about. My first thing was, are you okay? Yeah. Now I wish I could say that was always me, but I can tell you only the born again me does that. <laughs> the pre-Christ, it wasn't that way. Are you Okay. And I was like, Lord, that felt so good. And I give glory to Jesus for changing my heart and, and making me better. And I think for all of us, we do too. So yeah. So how do you become gentle? Well, you don't go out and try to muster it up. You don't go out and, and try to say, well, I'm just going to control myself better. You have to have Jesus as your master. And you have to let him train you. 